bad trips. They're certainly easier to do in a movie than good trips. I didn't see Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, but everyone said it proves again that it's very easy to portray a bad trip and very hard to portray a good trip. Um, well, they're all, first of all, I'll say all the conventional things about bad trips that, you know, it's not always supposed to be easy, that uh, sometimes learning curves feel very unpleasant when they're unfolding and uh, we learn from our mistakes and so forth and so on. So then having said all that, really what about bad trips? Well, they're horrible. <laughs> I mean, bad, bad trips make bad sex look like no problem, which is an amazing thing to achieve. <laughs> I don't know, you know, the, 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 I guess part of the fun or part of the challenge of being psychedelic people is that our method, which is drop and wait, uh, you, you, you never know. You know, you may think you know, uh, and you may do your rolfing and your go to gestalt and just... <laughs> be scrubbed and drained and shined with all your enzyme systems up and going. And it can still just chew your ass unmercifully. Uh, it's one of those places where I, who am not necessarily that uh, you know, eager for astrological explanations, reach eagerly for astrological explanations. Because if everything else is right, but the, and I've even noticed, you know, Moon in Scorpio for me is not a good time to do psychedelics. <laughs> I also, you know, I, I before a large trip, I will throw the I Ching, and without spending too much time on the I Ching. I can't remember which hexagram it is, but one of the 64 hexagrams says, uh, inquire again of the oracle if you have constancy, something or else, something else, something else. And almost invariably, I mean, I have no idea how many times in my life contemplating psychedelic trips I've thrown that hexagram, the hexagram which says, ask again. And so then I ask again, and if it's negative, I, I don't do it. I figure, you know, you have right brain tools and left brain tools. Somehow this question about bad trips is about your pre-trip intuition, feeling into the situation. And then, of course, there are obvious rules. I mean, there are guaranteed situations which give you bad trips. I mean, taking too much of a drug with people you don't know. Uh, taking large amounts of a drug and mixing it with uh, a lot of moving around in crowded social spaces. Um, synergies are, and synergies are simply combinations of drugs. You know, if somebody tells you they took ecstasy and then they snorted some ketamine and then they had a little nitrous oxide <laughs> and some GHB. This is, God knows, I mean literally only God knows because no, no clinical medical research is ever done on stuff like that. On the way people in the street actually take drugs is never studied mm -hmm. by medical science. And uh, synergies are where the strange things, the dangerous stuff happens, the heart fibrillations, the convulsions, the convulsive vomiting, the states of disorientation, prolonged states of sleeplessness, all of these things. Uh, so, you know, my attitude toward avoiding bad trips is for social purposes, raves and beach parties and whatever, low doses, you know. It's a almost a truism, or it is a truism, that if you, if you want to come down 
from a drug, whether a psychedelic drug or any other drug, the very best thing to do is furious exercise. You know, the guy who throws himself in the icy lake and swims across it, the guy who chops two cords of wood to come off some bender. Well, then uh, a, a dance club is almost like the perfect social situation designed to shorten a drug trip and dampen the effects. But people are such social creatures you know, I have said in, in many, many times over the years to the point where it's almost the McKenna method, although how you could think something so simple-minded was a method, was like the way to take psilocybin, for example, is take a, a stiff hit, like five grams if you're a 145-pound person, on an empty stomach and lie still in silent darkness. Well, this is almost the opposite of, you know, and the idea is you don't want, you want to concentrate on the thing itself, which is the drug projected against the black screen of your mind. You don't need doof coming in. You don't need smart drugs. You know, all of these things are actually distractions. And I think people don't are so reluctant to follow this advice because they actually have no faith in the drug. They think they will be bored. They think, well, if I did that, nothing would happen. Well, I'm telling you, you know, it's for ordinary people, isn't that what we said? This stuff is not for the swamis. They have their own methods. This is, uh, this is for the great unwashed masses of spiritually seeking humanity. Uh, so uh, lay down in silent darkness and take a look. Um, and then if the trip is really bad, then there are things you can do while it's happening that are helpful. Uh, the most obvious one is, uh, or the most effective, I don't know if it's the most obvious, but I really believe it's the most effective, is if you get into a place that you don't like, uh, and it's not physiological, it's not that you're having convulsions or vomiting, it's just that you're having thoughts which alarm you, you should sing. Uh, you can make whatever shamanic hash of this you wish, but the basic concept is to oxygenate your brain. There's something about bad states of mind on psychedelics are very frequently, in my observation, accompanied by shallow breathing. People get, you know when you thread a needle, everybody holds their breath. Nobody can thread a needle without holding their breath. It's like keeping your eyes open while you sneeze. A person, a human being cannot do this. So it, when we are really following our thought at the level of threading a needle, we stop breathing. And if you're not paying attention, this can go on for minutes, this very shallow breathing. You know, you're not breathing, dude. So... Uh, <laughs> And, and so what the thing to do is to sit up and, uh, you know, your favorite shamanic chant, uh, Fleetwood Mac recitation or whatever, just belt it out. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it may matter. I mean, if you choose certain mantras or something, you know, haystacks will burst into flame. But, uh, you know... And there's no obligation to be accurant or hip either. You know, it doesn't have to be Aphex Twins. It can be uh, row, row, row your boat, I've always preferred. Because it does contain the refrain, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. If you're loaded on psilocybin or ayahuasca, the thought that life is but a dream opens ahead of you and becomes epiphanous instead of ridiculous. Uh, I, but nobody does this a lot who doesn't then occasionally put in a very difficult evening. And, you know, part of your psychic, I guess your shamanic constitution is how quickly can you come back from a really 
bone-shaking psychedelic experience, either because it blew your mind in some way or something appalling happened. I remember, I mean, I remember a number of psychedelic trips that were hard to come back from, but I remember one in particular years ago where my friend and I took a lot of acid and, um, and um, late in the trip, like about 3.30 in the morning, he had a very dramatic epileptic seizure. And I had never seen an epileptic seizure. And, um, oh God, it, it just set off this cascade of hysterical activity. The, co the, the 911 people had to be called. I remember there was a real moment of truth in all this for me. I remember the apartment was on the second floor and, uh, and I saw the cop cars and everything pull up in front. We had flushed staggering amounts of dope, uh, <laughs> knowing that they were about to arrive. And I went tearing down to the front door, and I was completely loaded on acid. I mean, I could barely stand. And I could see through the glass the, the cop, and he said, open the door. We had locked the door earlier in the evening. He said, open the door. So I fumbled with the door for a few seconds, completely hysterically and ineffectively, and then I couldn't get the door open. So I stepped back from the door and said, shoot the lock off. <laughs> I realized, dude, <laughs> get a grip. <laughs> you're, you're going to have to, um, you know, th th this is headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> and the cop was like, <sighs> <laughs> so then, and and then I remember, you know, the, this trip to the hospital and, and, uh, I don't know what was going on. It was Herrick Hospital. It was in Berkeley, which was also a mental hospital. This bed, me standing at the end of the bed, trying to figure out, is he dead? Is he alive? What does this mean? Who am I? What's going on? And then there was a person who was obviously an inmate of the stranger wards of this mental hospital who was washing the floor with this big mop and sort of waltzing around us with this crazy expression and leaning over and looking at me and looking at him. And I just didn't know whether, is this really happening? And if it is happening, why is it happening? <laughs> and if it isn't happening, why do I think this is what's happening? <laughs> and, and then I, like, finally the doctors threw me out of there and I just walked the streets of Berkeley for hours and my mind was, like, spinning, just saying, something terrible has happened. Something terrible, terrible, terrible has happened. And it took days to, to you know, realize, yes, he had an epileptic fit. Here's what an epileptic seizure is. Here's the drug. Here's the prognosis. Here he is, seemingly all right. He came through it in much better shape, it seemed, than I did. I mean, I was deeply spun by all of this crazy shit. And that's not an out-of-control drug story. I mean, truly, I'm a very conservative person, so for me, that was an evening really getting beyond management. But some people, you know, start out like that. <laughs> I, I had friends in the 60s in New York City who would say, you know, in Manhattan, they would say, let's take 500 mics and hit the streets and mess with people's minds. Well, and you quickly discover there are people out there capable of messing with your mind and more than your mind. And But sitting up all night in Manhattan diners just taking on all comers for mind games is, you know, no way to uh, spend an evening. <laughs> Anyway, so much for the question, you know, what do you do about bad trips? If you have character, you live through them, and after a few months, go back to it. Many people, it, it's a bad trip that finishes them for psychedelics, and I don't think, you know, you're ever really immune to it. 
the funny thing about psychedelics, I think, especially psilocybin, I've noticed, is it's incredibly gentle with beginners. It almost never bites a beginner, you know, these clueless people who go to it with knees knocking. Usually, you know, the doors of heaven open and they're sweating. It's the veterans, it's the old battle-scarred uh, explorers who you know, come back from a certain given evening with their eyes bugging and uh, a tale to tell.